want to have the option to change something, then I can, you know, really change it instead of having to edit the audio or do whatever. Then I can just go to the MIDI or draw in automation I, a little bit. For me, you know, it's been a matter of trying to find discipline. And when I find myself printing things, it's like commit and then move on. And mm. if I don't like it, I'll just redo it. Right. But I mean, I have the same like you, except maybe older technology. I have that same. I think when you came last time, I showed you the Yamaha mm -hmm. DM2000. Yeah. And that also has a complete you know, control layer for Pro sure. Tools with all the same things you described, right. except mine is probably slower because my protocol is uh, Huey. So mm -hmm. it's got a little bit of lag, but you could still do moves and mutes and yeah, transport right. control and plugins and all that. So, right, yeah. and, and that was definitely one of the things I kind of wanted to touch on, like to, like from your perspective, you're fully engaged in using these new digital tools and sort of integrating them into workflow, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm really uh, locked into the potential of what can be done with, I, I can't stand AI. Like the concept of it just drives me freaking nuts. But right. I, like, I like the idea that you can have an EQ that'll just figure it out by itself <laughs> and then give you something. So like isotope stuff or, you know, fab filter. I, I think fab filter does a little automated stuff like that, but mainly isotope and, and uh, Sonable, I think is a comp another company that does what's called smart EQ where you just put an EQ on it and then it, it analyzes the track analyzes and it decides for you what yeah, exactly. it wants to do. Exactly. Now, like with the isotope, I haven't tried the Sonable, but with the isotope, what I haven't found that it does is just corrective. So just taking out frequencies that it needs to take out or suggesting the frequencies. Like it'll put you in the right direction and then you can kind of pull things down. But usually it'll like, it'll see that it's a drum. So it'll, you know, filter out the, the subs, kick up the, the lows, yeah. you know, come down on the mids a bit and kick up the highs. It'll do... It'll do its whole process, and it's like, no, I don't want that. You know, I just want to take away that sound. You know, like just take that sound out. You know, show me where that sound is. And um, right. I think there's a new one that just came out that does exactly that. Where it's wow. not trying to enhance; it's just taking away. I mean, look, there are different levels of Jedi, and <laughs> some people like you know to keep their lightsabers free and clear so they can like go to battle however they want mm -hmm. but there may be assistant jedis or apprentice level yeah. that need sort of a lightsaber to have sort of some, some guided ai so that you know it could fight for them yeah so, same thing i mean i i like <laughs> you know you might have had a mixed assistant back in the day i'm i'm not sure but you know, usually the guys that are mixing, like the huge, you know, Taylor Swift records, or yeah. whatever, they have somebody that sits there and does what I'm asking for the for the AI to do, which is take out all the bullshit well, <laughs> and then just make it sound like it's what an to sound engineer like would do. It's not an assistant; that's a, a real engineer. And like, say, you know, I don't think that it's ever something that can be replaced. In other words. If you hire a proper skilled sound engineer, not only do they do an incredible job because they know exactly how to do side, side chain compression yeah. tricks and all the other advanced stuff yeah. that sometimes we forget, but more importantly, I think as a producer, yeah. it allows you, or, and as an artist even more, delegating some of these tasks to them allows you to step back and take some distance or yeah. go shoot the shit in the other room. Yeah. And then, with fresh ears, yeah. listen back to what's going on. Whereas when you just work on your own, yeah. you're kind of at the mercy of whether you're able to keep that perspective. Yeah, you're, you are right about that, definitely. Now, and, and what I was talking about, the assistants, like Dave Penzato is somebody who, you know, talks about it all the time, <coughs> where he has a, a, somebody who just deals with organizing the files for him to just 
move the faders, put some compression, or or he already told them to put in a certain type of compressor, so he just messes. He has right. a template, whatever. Yeah. And then he mixes it, and they can keep going quicker. Now, from the the aspect of being a producer and being able to get fresh ears, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who is Dr. Dre's partner. Um, I forget. Um, I'm sorry. At Apple Music, um, he uh, Jimmy uh, I- Iovine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and in the documentary, and I'm I'm an avid. Like, I'm a freak for watching docs and for, you know, trying to find out how other people are working right. and, and really paying attention to that. And he said that uh, when he was when he was learning, um, uh-huh. you know, he had to he sat in front of the board and the producer would say, yeah, you know, give me less 20, you know, or give me more 5K or do this or whatever. And he had to, you know, but the but. The producer was so locked in to, yeah, okay, I think that sounds like 5K, so take out 5K, or that sounds like like uh, 200, so let's take out 200, or you know, whatever whatever the situation is, and it made it where he was able to learn better about, you know, not only how to do his job, but to identify frequencies and all that stuff, and I would love to do that, but I'm a control freak. So I need to be able to feel like I'm touching. I feel I feel like a craftsman when I'm doing this stuff. You know, I don't I don't I don't do music to make Model Ts. You know, I do music to make Ferraris. Right. You know, I'm interested in the hand building of of it instead of the mass production part of it. Uh, certainly. I mean, look, I. I can't disagree with you. I've also, over the years, uh, done some of the most revered mixes, sometimes on my own, but equally I could say I've done some of my best work with a team of qualified people who really kicked ass. Say, for example, let me use the Yazoo situation. Mm -hmm. That's John Roby on keyboards, Mm -hmm. Lenny Underwood also on keyboards, Mm Um, John Patoker, engineer at Sigma Sound Studio in New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the combination of all this is what made the remix that we put together so incredible. Without John Roby's keyboards, Mm -hmm. it would not have happened the same way. And without John Patoker's real clean and precise sound and presentation, I don't think it would it would have been a mess. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. But then I go, in the same year, I also went in the studio and did uh, Dinosaur L. Mm -hmm. And that was done on a budget at Right Track Studios when Mm -hmm. I label was just getting started this was their first release and i couldn't even afford an engineer so i just went in with the assistant Mm -hmm. he patched things for me and then we worked right and i did everything and I still manage, I guess, somehow to make it sound okay, but I don't think the sonics are anywhere as good as when I work with Patoker. It, it has the vibe, has the feel, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I think sometimes, you know, we, we, we make our own way through things and we mm. manage to create something that's coherent. Mm. But I'm just questioning, like, nowadays, do you not think that it's becoming more scientific, like I'm more specifically talking about how I hear certain people make the bass come out of the records. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's a whole science of its own, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, when, I think for, for you, being in the business, a good 10 20 years 10 years probably before i got in the business right you know i started in 89 so you were mixing records by 79 78 78 so 10 year difference that you know your approach to um to plugins to digital technology is going to be with an analog year same thing with mine but mine is analog in a slightly different way because you know, I didn't have the budget to use tape a lot. 
you know, even though we had to use tape, so I had to come from, you know, cassette, or I had to come from right. just rolling it straight the straight to two right. track, and then it went to digital and whatever. But when I go to program sense, I go to program sense with the logic of how I used to program a uh, program plugin sense with the logic that I used to uh, use to program my uh, Prophet six hundred or right. or uh, whatever, uh -huh. and. With the new uh, uh, people that are coming out, they probably never touched a mini mog in their life. They don't. They never touched a Poltec. They never had any of these things. Right. So their approach to bass is going to be on a different level. So it's less about how it could feel vibey and funky. You know, like they're not coming from listening to Bootsy and Roger and Zap records. They're coming from listening to records that that are digital, that are more precise, so the, the, um, the objective to get the bass to sound more precise is going to be uh, a larger... But I, I think this is one of the most significant advances in engineering in the last 15-20 years, is that when you compare records that were, say, made in the mid-90s mm. or early 2000s, and you compare it to records who are, which are made today, mm. It's almost like we've gained an extra half octave below mm -hmm. where people are now able to control sound at frequencies between 30 and 55 or 60 hertz mm -hmm. in a way that when I go to clubs and I hear those records, I mm -hmm. can tell. And there's all these special techniques they use mm -hmm. with, again, some side chain gating mm -hmm. and triggering so that the bass only kicks in when it needs to but they mm -hmm. use that extra mm -hmm. in ways that you know right. I, I think are so incredibly effective so do you mm -hmm. you do some of that sometimes um not on purpose <laughs> i might luck out every so often my process to to composition and mix has always been you know i find something that happens then and i never would try to repeat it so it wasn't that's why I was talking about the mix bus situation because right. it's all there and I don't have to think about, you know, setting up something, coming back to it, you know, putting a strip in that's like this or whatever. It's just all there and I just treat it like it is and that's how, how I've always treated, you know, when I have You mean a, like a piece of art and then it cannot be repeated? Sort of, yeah. Sort of. Okay. It's, it's like that. Um, you know, when I started using patch bays, I would deal with things visually. Analog patch base yes. we're talking about. Right. So I would deal with things visually where if I got into a mix an engineer that I was using at the time, he'd he'd you know, he'd put things together and I come in and I hear and then I look at the patch bay and it's like, there's too much shit patched in and pull it all out. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and pull it all out. It's like let's start over again. <laughs> you know, that's that's like my <laughs> that's my process and yeah you know most of the time we would get a mix that I would find better it's like when you come in and and everything's up on a board and you're like okay you know and you let's start again and then you just start start again and then okay that feels you're vibing with it right. you know so like playing the mixer is like if if uh calvin scholler or, or john dixon are playing a synth and you know while they're they're playing notes they're modulating the parameters in some way you know modulating the free uh, the frequency or the yeah. the filter or you know whatever they're doing and it gives it that extra kind of thing and that's what i that's where my head is and unfortunately when you get too cyber on all this then it makes it maybe not as possible to just and then start off, you're like taking, maybe even taking plugins out. It's like throwing them out, you know, and it's ugh. But you can so pretty much automate everything. In a bit too much. I mean, let's yeah. say, I don't know. Okay, here's one important thing which I think needs to be mentioned. And please help me out because yeah. I'm not sure that I'm up to date. Yeah. Um, I sometimes, you know, spend time on that infamous message board. Mm -hmm. Gear sluts. Oh. Okay, but the, the thing I keep reading <laughs> on the board is that there is one feature that people really love so much about Pro Tools, and I guess yeah. as a, mainly a Pro Tools user for the, my mixes, mm -hmm. I've always taken for granted that it's there. It's the idea of playlists. So if you take 
a sound and you, you have your track and you have like all these bits of audio mm. right that consists a playlist and then you can duplicate that and edit it or change it or completely do like what you were talking about yeah. Yeah. but you still keep the old one and you can take a piece of that one if you liked it and then move it to the new playlist that's a blank slate and I'm hearing that other programs don't really have that, or some are just starting to f have it. Mm. Well, you, you, like you have the same track, so it has the same plugins, mm. the same sounds, the same routing, whatever. But mm. all that you, you can do with the playlist is you can rearrange your different pieces of audio mm. or MIDI data or whatever it is that's mm. contained in the track. And then you can not just, you know, do tabula rasa, of you know starting back from the zero you were talking about but you can s still keep whatever you did before and mix and match mm -hmm. so when you do it in the harrison mix bus that's never something you do in your workflow um no and you just do it i just do it yeah and that's 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 what's kind of important to me about mix bus is that it feels like i'm working in a domain that is is analog um even though it's on on your screen Right. Um, Logic do, does something with folders where you can. Okay, but that's putting tracks together as group tracks so that once you have a folder in Logic, you can affect or route all the elements that are in the folder to the same direction. Or but you can do that in the arrangement as well. So you can take. You can take a folder and then you can repeat the folder. Or yeah. You can yes. take it and, but, and then but, maybe uh, duplicate it, change something different, and then put it in an arrangement. I mean, I guess you could around. copy the folder and do one operation, mute the original one and do the operation again on the new copy of yeah. it so that you could yeah. do it differently. So I, th yeah. I think that's probably not far off from what you can do in Pro Tools. With okay. Your playlists. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Other question. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, when people ask me to use, I over the years I've used. Logic Audio, mm -hmm. Ableton Live, yeah. Nuendo, Cubase. Yeah. I've never used Cubase. Yeah. And, and Pro Tools. Yeah. But the one thing that I really am so completely over the moon about yeah. with Pro Tools is, to me, it feels like a normal console where I want to go to a bus and I have a track, right, right that I'm working on, say like my vocal, yeah. and I send it with the bus to something else it could mm -hmm. be to an effect to mm -hmm. another track to this to that and the way pro tools is structured it has that built in so that on the on the next track you could say receive that bus that you sent the vocal to mm -hmm. whereas on ableton live whenever i do this i need to create a, a ghost track mm -hmm. to send the element again pre fader to the to the thing where I want it's so not intuitive so I don't yeah I mean you on analog consoles you know what I'm talking about right sure um when you, know, you, you bust something you punch the button yeah. I wanted to go to bus 32 and click then right and then bus 32 on the other side you could patch out of the patch bay and say I want bus 32 to go into this other track mm -hmm. or into this processor and then the processor will come back and that that architecture to me, I don't know. I've never found any other software, uh, DAW like yeah. software that does that. Do you? Uh, Logic can do do stuff like that. Logic's pretty good. Um, Logic has they've made steps to make their program a mix of Pro Tools and Ableton, but right. it's Logic. You know, right. so they have scenes that you can you can trigger. Like with Ableton now, yeah, uh, you can do almost exactly the same thing. <coughs> is that in the environment, do. or you have to set it up in the environment? Um, no, it, it, it's especially set up. You just have to go to, you know, there's a, a button at the top that's got some squares, and you press it, and then all of a sudden that thing pops up, so, and then you can just do it. So like let Ableton. me cut to another thing. Yeah. When you travel, yeah, if you have to make music, or you have an idea, and you want to put a sketch together and all yeah, that, yeah. oh, you're not Logic? On Logic too, but Ableton is is the is the go to for just really quick ideas because it can be very fast. But what I don't like about Ableton is that you know it it when you record something in it, it warps it automatically, 
And you're well, you can set that cut, off. You're supposed to be able to cut it off, but for some reason it just does it. You know, so when you import something in, you can make it where it doesn't warp on that. For long samples. For anything. Well, but, okay. All right. But uh, once you once I do something that makes that in the audio, so if I do it and then do some automation or whatever and then bounce the audio, then it'll warp it immediately. And if you're not paying attention, you can have all this new stuff warped and then it just it, you can hear it going and making these little Well, you could set the algorithm like. on if like say if you save your Ableton session, the original will still be there where you could change the the warp mode too complex or whatever. It sounds like shit. The only the only warp mode that I like is the repitch. That's the only warp mode that I like. So for what? For bass lines or piano Just or single note? Anything because when I, it, I find repitch on horns is not good. Yeah, I don't I just see I don't use horns, so I can't okay. really tell you, you know. All right. But I just like repitch because like for instance when I take um, uh, I'll do edit I do editing mostly in Logic and in and in uh, in Ableton. And in some cases Ableton can be way faster to edit. So if I take uh, a track that I want to DJ, right. but I don't like the arrangement of it, then I'll rearrange, I'll rearrange everything and then bounce it out and then I can play it in the arrangement that okay. I like. Rearrange everything where? In Pro Tool, uh, in Ableton or in, in Logic? In Ableton or Logic, it doesn't matter. I can, okay. you know, so it's just making a new arrangement. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, so, quick edit. Yeah, doing an edit without tape. <laughs> you know, right. without a razor. No, no, so, okay. you know, the intro's too long. Yeah, yeah you bounce the intro's it back. not long enough. You might whatever. do a processing and blah, blah, blah. Whatever. Yeah. So, um, when I want it to stay at the tempo, right. then I use repitch. I don't, I don't mind if, it, if the pitch changes or whatever because it's not going to change that much because I'm not changing the tempo by that much. So, it's just right. going to be by a few cents or whatever because the tempo changes by uh -huh. you know I'd speed it up by two or three db or slow it down but and and in many cases i like the way things sound with the pitch dropped more than i do than because the 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 drop in pitch is way funkier it's just like you know you get this what sometimes you take tracks and you change the original key and drop it down a couple of like I like that much better. That's why I don't don't use um, on on CDJs. I don't. Oh yeah, use, master uh, tempo never. Master tempo yeah never. So when it drops down, you get in the funk. Of course. Yeah, you know. Totally. So that's the same thing in Ableton. I'm with you so, on that. So I use repitch instead of instead of co complex. I hate the way it sounds. I hate the way beat the beat one. It's just it always makes things gurgle and do nasty stuff that I don't really on like. on percussion. Just, I just don't like it. I'm sorry. I mean, beat is pretty precise for drums. I just don't like it. I can really? hear it going. <laughs> there's like these, because because there's ways of changing how it plays. So the standard is that it has an arrow that goes to the right and an arrow that goes to the left. But you could change it where the arrows only go to the right. Oh, the and warp the, mode. On you mean? the warp, yeah. yeah. So when I find that if I do 16, uh, 16th notes and then put the arrows going in the same direction, then it doesn't do that thing so much. It just goes like that. And by doing 16th, uh, 16th note, right. then it's doing it so fast right. that you might not hear it in the same way because that 16th note is trying to do this. Because they're always going in both ways, you know. So it's like, and it's trying to stay well, like this. What, what happens, I think, technically, the warping algorithm yeah. is looking at the slices of audio mm -hmm. and deciding. So if it needs to make it shorter, it just slices it off. Mm -hmm. And if it needs to make it wider, mm -hmm. then it, it interpolates. And the arrows that you're talking about, I think they're the things that decide whether to only use forward samples mm -hmm. or forward and reverse alternating so that it does a smooth crossfade to smooth the yeah, sound out. I can, I can hear it. I I'm, I'm only guessing. Okay. <laughs> I don't know I don't, this for sure. And there are a lot of Ableton guys. Right. Like I got, I did something for Attack Magazine and they used a quote that I didn't think was a good quote to use. Right. And it really got everybody freaked out. 
Like, oh, yeah, you know, they just went on Ableton defensive. Like, oh, yeah, you can't hear a process. You can't hear it. You know, no, no, no. It's like, motherfucker, I come from analog days. I can hear shit that your ass probably can't hear because you got to listen differently, you know? So it's like, come on, give me a break with this. And then, um, uh, uh, so it's, it's uh, Ableton to do quick ideas, I think is great. Right. Um, logic to put everything together so that more it, like an arrangement composition structure yeah and then actually with with um so if i want to like do eq and like one one of um one of th one of the uad pieces that i started using is that uh uh that uh little lapse phase reverse thing i don't know mm -hmm. if you use it nope. so it's basically for not flipping the phase is for for adjusting the phase so instead of it being 180 you right. know then it'll go by 10 20 30 40 for you know stereo tracks or um, mono it's for everything right you know so so you play with that until you're happy i was watching uh luca luca i forgot what his name is he um engineers and mixes diplo stuff and he did a thing where he talked about using the SSL uh, phase um, phase fixer, which is basically the same as a little labs one. And how he will just take a he'll take a kick drum and he'll mess with the phase a bit to see where he likes it to sit. Right. And then he'll build things around where he sits certain things and 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 he. He gets, and you can get a more defined sound in that way. You know, instead of it being like, okay, the bass and the kick aren't really hidden together, so I'm going to put the bass out of phase, or, you know, I'm going to put the kick out of phase, or whatever it is, so that it'll be a little more uh, cohesive. But you don't have to go flipping the phase, you can just move the phase a tad bit. Do you use a graphic representation, like an analyzer, when you do things like that? Yeah, yeah, a few things. Yeah. What plugin do you like for that? I I use that TC uh, meter. It's TC a, Electronics. Yeah, they make an external meter. It's really good. Oh, so. external meter. Yeah. Okay, so and this has like a, a sum and difference, and more like a mastering kind of meter. It it's got some of the things that you would find in those SSL consoles back in the day. You know, right. where you could see the phase. Well, the mastering labs all had that. That's sure. a standard thing. Right. You must have it. Right. Yes. So yes. But I when you're on the road, you version. can't use any of that. Uh, they do have a plug-in version of it, um, right. but I think you have to take the meter with you because it has to be plugged in in order to use the plug-in version. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of silly. It's kind of shitty. But no. now, from your perspective, and I, I just kind of remember, I mean, this was a real highlight. Um, we did a gig together where you brought a modular synthesizer with oh, you. Yeah. And uh, we were on stage thrown, basically improvising yes. with the Maurice von Oswald trio. That's right. This was one of the most high-pressure gigs I've ever played in my <laughs> life. Especially great was the fact that they didn't give us enough time to re set up and rehearse. Yeah. So I was still patching and trying things while the concert had started. But I, I could see that you really have spent a lot of time investing in modular uh, euro rack technology and all that so where are you with that is that ongoing have you kept building your your modular rig um because this was like a traveling model like yeah, a suitcase yeah, yeah i have i have a few suitcases um okay first of all if you guys don't already know francois is a perfectionist so he not only deserves the time to get ready, but he just demands to have that amount of time to be to be able to do what he does and to do it the best that he can. So, so we didn't have a lot of time, but it was enough time for us to do what we had to do. And um, on that gig, yeah, it was uh, it was it's um, Morris's band, but it was um, yeah Sasuri Party on percussion. Was it? Vladislav Delay. Vladislav Delay, yeah. yeah. Or Sasu. Is that what? Yeah. Ah, I didn't know. Okay. He just did this thing uh, I saw with Sly and Robbie live. He played with Sly and Robbie a few wow. times live. Wow, okay. 
Um, but my modular stuff, that... Um, that was a nifty little thing you had that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the pieces I had, uh, Schwayman, he just passed away. Uh, but I had a lot of Schwayman stuff in there. And the Schwayman stuff is was to me the best sounding Eurorack stuff because it wasn't trying to sound vintage. So like the Dolfer stuff just sounded, like the filters on it just sounded too unprecise and dirty to me. I just didn't didn't like That's why I didn't really get into Dolfer stuff. Um, I started buying Schwayman because Schwayman just sounded like right, right the way I felt that it should should sound. And again, people, you know, who don't have the history with, you know, synthesizers yeah. and, and all that will just think that I'm being a, being a fool. But no, you can hear these things. Right. And uh, I used to use Livewire as well. That guy passed away. Um, I had some, some cool things. I think it was Livewire, what it was called. Um, and then Ricardo Villalobos... And I would go back and forth about modular all the time and, right. and Mark Ernestus and modular. <clears throat> and part of the reason why the, um, uh, his mixer, the uh, Zal mixer, has a uh, CV filter part in it. Is we, we're going to come back to that, by the way. I, yeah, wanted, I wanted to. But, you know, I'm not trying to play it, but right. it's because of me mentioning the Mark. Like, right. Why we're we're going to explain that. I, I think people <laughs> need to understand yeah. what we're talking about. This is like a yeah. super important point to me because yeah. it's really at the intersection of what we discussed before, which is processing and mixing, yeah. and what we're talking about now, which is synthesizers. So, yeah. But from your perspective, when you travel, yeah. do you carry a modular, little modular with you? I used to, you? yeah. I used to carry, I had a, um, my case was a Dolfer case. That's about as far as I would go. Oh, and maybe there were some multiples that were Dolfer. But um, uh, I, d I had the, the hard case and have all my Schwayman and all this stuff in it. And, and did it cables. travel Psh well? Uh, in those Dolfer cases, the, the power yeah. supplies weren't necessarily mounted correctly. Didn't you have like a double Pelican to hold it? Or I something? didn't have a Pelican. It was only the Dolfer. Right. And uh, the, the power supplies are too heavy and it would break off. Ah. And it could, you know, damage your whole, right. the whole thing. So I had to, to have a couple of them repaired. Right. Yeah. But otherwise, you find yourself going to the modular on a pretty consistent basis or no, it's yeah, only no. for certain things um i have some modular in my studio rack that i haven't touched in a long time and i still have actually i've taken parts out of those cases and they're just kind of scattered around so i don't even know i'm not even using modular in the same way that i was um the cool thing about schwayman stuff and the reason why it's in my rack in the studio is because he had um, a unit that was a compressor that could, it was CV controlled. He had um, a little four channel mixer that was fantastic that um, not only was the volume CV controlled, but the panning CV control too. And with the, with the panning being CV controlled, you can use the LFO to control the panning Right. however you want to do it so whatever whatever uh wave shape you want to want to use uh -huh. in order to make the pan happen you could do it but he made this amazing phase um uh module as a f i forgot what it was called uh phase ph4 i think is the, the model number of it and you patch that into the into the uh the the pan mm -hmm. And it wouldn't go left and right. It felt like it was going around your head. Okay. And that's that's what really was like, okay, I'm sticking with Schwayman. Schwayman stuff is killing because right. you know it was doing like psychoacoustic processing. It it was doing something right. that that instead of it just being a hard left, hard right. It I mean felt look, like it, it sounds to me like you're really digging into a lot of detail with these things.